Well, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Welcome to St. Mary's Vicarage on this, the uh, 4th of May, Monday, the 4th of May, uh, week seven of our lockdown. And it's a lovely sunny day uh, outside here in Handley this morning. Good morning, Jenny. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning, Danny. Good morning, Annie and Mike. Lovely to uh, see you all. Um, I'm on my uh, second cup of um, very strong coffee this morning. I normally drink decaf apart from my uh, first one in the morning, which is um, uh, full leaded. Good morning, Paul. As I just did not really sleep at all last night. Um, I'm not normally a, a bad sleeper at all. I'm a very good sleeper uh, once I go off. But um, every so often I just get to uh, one of those nights where I just cannot get to sleep. Uh, good morning, Bill. Uh, good morning, Peter. Uh, good morning, Lynn. And um, <coughs> last night was one of those. I sort of, um, I am a night owl, naturally, I'll have to say to you. So it is not unusual for me sometimes to go to bed at sort of 2 a.m. in the morning. I find I work better um, late at night. I'll do things late at night. But I have to say, normally, even if I, you know, hit the sack at uh, 2 a.m., I'm normally out like a light. Anyhow, that may have been the problem was that I sort of went to bed a sort of bit earlier than I normally do um, last night. So I was uh, uh, tucked in um, by about sort of half past 10, I think. And I watched a bit of um, uh, YouTube. I like watching. Uh, uh, you get lots of photographers on YouTube. There's a whole range of them. Um, so most of them sort of professionals or semi-professionals and it's quite interesting seeing the work they do. There's a lovely guy called um, Paul Smith who's a photographer in New Zealand and um, his YouTube channel is brilliant. So I watched a little bit of that, wasn't particularly late. Anyhow, tried to go to sleep about half eleven and uh, no, that wasn't happening. And um, I sort of lay there, you know, you, you sort of lie there awake hoping to go to sleep and um, that process continued until about 3 a.m. in the morning um, at which point I decided to call it quits and sort of get up come downstairs make myself a cup of decaf tea have to be said at that point and have some buttered toast <coughs> in the hope that um, uh, that would sort out the insomnia and get me back to sleep good morning Gemma lovely to see you all um, and um, I came down and says, put the telly on, um, just out of curiosity to see what people watched at 3.30 a.m. in the morning. What really surprised me is that um, uh, <laughs> oh, loads of the channels, they're all trying to sell you stuff. I, 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 I you know, um, and a few people have um, made some comments um, who, who do really have trouble sleeping. So clearly there is a big market to sell people cordless vacuum cleaners at 3 a.m. in the morning. I was really quite um, uh, uh, quite um, sort of amused at that, really. Anyhow, um, still didn't feel sleepy at all. Um, so I decided to do some man stuff. And um, we've had two dripping taps um, in the vicarage. We've had one in the downstairs loo and one in the upstairs loo. Um, I notified the diocese about it um, months ago. Uh, but obviously two dripping taps is not a huge priority at this time. Has been driving Mrs Vicarage bonkers because you have got to tighten it really tight to even stop it sort of running. Um, so I went in the garage and like most um, chaps, my garage is full of thing, lots of little drawers. I have those things on the walls with hundreds of little drawers. So I spent about 20 minutes going through all my little drawers looking for tap washers. Um, which I eventually found a selection of them. Good morning, Sarah. Lovely to see you. So I eventually found a selection of tap washers. Now, by this time, it was about, I think, 10 past five in the morning. So I decided to do some plumbing uh, at that point, very quietly. Stealth plumbing it was, I have to say. Uh, so it's not to wake up the rest of the family. Uh, but in the, I uh, did the downstairs toilet tap first, a um, little bit of... Um, uh, penetrating oil just to get in there, got my two spanners and um, turned the water off, loosened it all up, uh, got the uh, got the tap off, took the old washer off, which seemed to be a big washer. Somebody had put a washer in there that I think was far too big. Morning, Sally. Morning, Jane. Uh, replaced the washer and um, 
put the tap all back together again, turned on the water, hey presto, tap didn't drip anymore. And so as I was on a roll, um, by then it was 5.30 in the morning, I decided to tackle the upstairs tap. That involved even more stealth because the um, bathroom upstairs, we've got Ben's room on one side and Alex's on the other. So I had to do that very quietly. Um, but I as well, stopped that dripping tap, um, put all my tools away. <clears throat> and by which point it was about quarter to six. And I did feel slightly sleepy then. <laughs> and um, so I headed back to bed. And I think I did, in fairness, I think I did fall asleep for about an hour. Anyhow, uh, I'm on my second uh, cup of fully leaded um, coffee this morning with a double shot of espresso in it, uh, as I didn't have a particularly uh, good night. But uh, the positive sign is we now don't have any dripping taps um in the vicarage um so that's all been sorted uh hopefully as today monday is uh, tends to be my day off after this broadcast i'm hopefully going to go for a good walk uh get some fresh air because i normally find that um uh that does the trick um so my heart goes out to you to all of those who um struggle sleeping at night because i did put a post up on facebook and quite a few people uh responded saying um yeah they couldn't sleep either um so uh <clears throat> i don't know what to suggest apart from maybe try a bit of plumbing um it sort of helped me but um i know for some people it's a real problem uh sleeping getting to sleep at night but something that thankfully doesn't normally happen to me uh good morning mary lovely to see you all <coughs> um there is no bills just said uh is there no limit to this man's talent i only changed a couple of washers my granddad God bless him. God rest his soul. Harry Hancock. Um, he was a very practical man. Had set up an engineering firm. He taught me how to do all of this stuff. So I remember we're about the age of um, sort of thing you teach an eight year old how to change a washer on a tap. So it's always served me well. It was just finding the washers. But um, as I said, us chaps have um, tins, drawers, jars of stuff everywhere. You know, we keep all of this stuff, don't we? Uh, my garage is full of it and we know it's there. But finding it is another question altogether. So hey ho, um, that was my night last night. Um, <clears throat> thanks for those who joined us uh, yesterday for the family service and watched it later on. And for the Zoom uh, coffee after church, I think that went pretty well. <coughs> um, thanks, Mike, for sorting out the tech. Um, we managed to get that going uh, pretty well and had a good conversation uh, for about 40 minutes or so. And uh, it was lovely to be able to <coughs> chat with people face to face. Um, so we're going to try and do that again. I'm hoping to better do that um, this coming Thursday um, morning. I want to talk to Mike exactly about the timings, but maybe round about sort of um, 11.30 sort of time again, because we would normally have had our wonderful church cafe, Magnifi Cafe at that time. And we'll try and do a Zoom call again and send out uh, an invitation. Now, I did make a bit of a mistake yesterday when I was doing the notices <clears throat> in church because I said that the service this coming Sunday would be a communion service. And I do apologise, that was wrong. That's in a fortnight's time. Um, uh, I'd completely forgotten that, of course, this coming weekend we're doing our virtual First Woodcuts um, Scout Camp, uh, which I'm really excited about because um, uh, we should have all been going away on camp. And this would have been my first proper away camp i've done a winter camp down at the uh, hq but this would have been my first proper scout camp as a scout leader as a youth worker i've taken youngsters all over the world and done all sorts of stuff like that so in a sense that's not a new experience but as a scout leader um that was going to be a new experience <clears throat> and i was going to be going with ben who's also an assistant leader will stokes who's um also uh, looks after our um section with us and of course skip skip rob so really looking forward to doing that but of course that isn't happening so we've come up with this idea of doing a virtual uh, scout camp uh, um, naomi um, she's designed uh, a wonderful logo for our virtual camp there will be a proper badge for uh, youngsters and the grown-ups i think for doing the scout camp and such like um, so we're all going to be setting up our tents either in the garden or if you haven't got a tent we're going to build dens in the houses so Ben and I are going to be doing this 
um <clears throat> i've ordered and this is another thing where as i said earlier you don't need to go to b and q i've ordered a sort of fire pit thing we used to have one in the previous vicarage but it just completely rusted away so when we moved it wasn't really worth taking it it went down to the recycling at the tip so i've ordered another one of those which hopefully will turn up tomorrow or wednesday and then i'm borrowing from the scout hut a dutch oven and one of those sort of stands to put over it because um, ben and i are going to cook um, outside on the fire a uh, spanish chicken chorizo and bean casserole uh, is what we're going to do and we will we'll post some of that live too but that does mean that the Sunday service this Sunday is actually going to be um, a sort of scout Sunday service, um, also marking VE Day, because of course it's VE Day, 75th anniversary on Friday. And um, I'm hoping if the tech works, uh, I, you won't see me sitting here. I wouldn't have gone very far, but um, I'll be out in the garden where we've created our um, scout um, camp. And I'll be there with Ben, <coughs> probably Kate and Alex as well. And um, we'll have a short service to mark the Scout Camp as we would do on Scout Camp. I would have been away from church this Sunday. It would have been lovely Paul um, Skinner who would have been conducting the service if church had been going. But we'll do that. But I, what we're going to do is all, it's all going to happen on this channel, on the uh, St Mary's Facebook page channel. And the Scouts are going to be asked to join us wherever they are on that um, so I hope you'll join us for that. It, it'll be quite a much shorter show of service. It'll be a hymn at the beginning, uh, probably Jerusalem. We're going to sing a uh, first verse national anthem, uh, a reading and a couple of other scout bits and pieces. Um, but I hope you'll join us um, for that on Sunday. And then in a fortnight's time, it'll be a Holy Communion. But who knows? Um, our Prime Minister is going to announce some stuff on Friday um, and we may well be able to reopen our churches in some form. But I'm going to give that very careful thought because I appreciate that even if we are allowed after next weekend in some form to um, hold services again in church, there are going to be lots of members of our congregation uh, who are wiser in years, um, who may not be able to attend because they uh, have been instructed not to sort of um, uh, gather together with other people. Um, so in some form, we will be continuing the um, broadcasts uh, and I hope before too long, we may even be able to live broadcast from St Mary's. Um, we were talking about getting Wi-Fi into St Mary's so that we could do that in any case before the uh, lockdown. So people could watch services online um, and such like. Um, so what we want to do is sort of take some of the new stuff that we've learnt and um, keep some of the new people that we've reached out to who might not want to actually physically come along to church on a Sunday or can't um, and we'll just see how that goes but I'll try and keep the 10 a.m broadcasts um, going I think that I think we're going to be in some form of lockdown one way or another for quite some time to come anyhow uh, another sip of full leaded if you don't mind so um, today is an interesting day the 4th of May um, turning to this book, <coughs> Exciting Holiness, which is the Anglican Book of Saints. And as I say, it's different to the Roman Catholic one I've got. And um, <coughs> on the 4th of May, um, the Church of England, or the Anglican Church, um, gives thanks for English saints and martyrs of the Reformation era. <coughs> so you can understand why that isn't in the Roman Catholic book. But it just says here... Uh, this day is set aside to remember all who witnessed to their Christian faith during the conflicts in the church and state in England, which lasted uh, from the 14th to the 17th centuries, but were their most intensive in the 16th century. Though the reform movement was aimed chiefly at the papacy, many Christian men and women of holiness suffered for their allegiance to what they believed to be the truth of the gospel. As the movement grew in strength, it suffered its own uh, uh, internal struggles, with one group determined that they were the keepers of the truth, and all others were therefore at least in a state of ignorance, and at worst heretical. Nothing changes, and I'll come to that in a minute. In the 20th century, ecumenical links drew the churches closer to each other in faith and worship, and all now recognised both the good and evil that evolved from the Reformation um, era. So the 4th of May, 
we remember English saints and martyrs of the reformed era. So uh, in a sense, <coughs> people like um, uh, Cramner, uh, for example, um, uh, and in a sense, it's people that were on both sides of that religious struggle, Catholics and um, uh, Protestants. <coughs> so the reading today, um, bearing in mind um, that is the sort of uh, notion for today in the Church of England in particular, is a reading from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. And <clears throat> it's, been, it's a reading, it's a passage of scripture that's always been very close to my heart in um, uh, my own Christian pilgrimage and ministry. Um, I wasn't brought up really as a Christian. Um, my mother is Spanish and is a Roman Catholic by birth and had a very strict Roman Catholic upbringing in Spain. She attended a convent school and um, uh, when she came to England for a year uh, to learn English and lived in the convent um, while she was doing that, she helped work in the convent. She worked in the kitchens and did other bits and pieces. And that's how she met my um, father. My mum always jokes to this day that um, <clears throat> she came to England, I think she was about 21, 2021 20, she came to England uh, to learn Spanish um, for a year I think it's 50 56 57 years on she's still here and she says she'll go back to Spain when she's learned English properly in her very thick Spanish accent anyhow she met my dad got married but um, she didn't get married in the Roman Catholic Church because she was completely fed up of um, the church um, by the time she got married so she was married in an Anglican church, which, of course, if you're a Roman Catholic back in those, those days, meant you were um, <clears throat> immediately excommunicated, which he thought was a pretty good thing. And my dad, uh, God bless him, I think if he was filling out a census, would tick um, Anglican. Um, so as a young child, I remember being taken to mass a couple of times by my mum. But that was mainly because we probably had um, some Catholic friends around or staying and that was the thing to do. And occasionally we would pitch up at the um, Church of England Church, St Peter's Burnham, <coughs> um, for various things there. Oddly enough, my grandmother, who came over from Spain for um, about three or four years to live in England, um, she was the housekeeper <coughs> of the Church of England vicar in our village, who was a single chap. Um, those of you who are Father Ted fans, she was the sort of Spanish equivalent of Mrs Doyle. Um, for this uh, for this chap. So uh, I got involved with church when I was at boarding school. We had a young chaplain who uh, uh, lots of us thought was very, very cool. And um, though church was quite traditional, it's quite high church, um, he made it interesting and accessible um, to us. So I was never brought up as a Christian. Um, most of my friends were not Christians. And to be honest with you, uh, the majority of my friends today still are not churchgoers. So I'm, I'm sort of an outsider that's come in. And I think probably because of that, um, I've always struggled with um, the way the church sometimes views those who are on the outside of it. I've never quite got it because that's where I come from. Um, and I um, still have a sort of love-hate relationship with um, established religion. Um, I'm, I'm in it, I've committed my life to it, um, uh, I work in it, uh, and I have that sort of love for it, but I really struggle with the way sometimes it, uh, the established church views those on the outside of it, um, and I don't quite get it. And this reading basically sums it up for me and has been how I've uh, dealt with this. So it's from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. <clears throat> The apostles and the brothers in Judah heard that the pagans too had accepted the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, the Jews criticised him and said, So you have been visiting the uncircumcised and eating with them, have you? Peter, in reply, gave them the detailed point to point. One day, when I was in the town of Jaffa, he began, I fell into, fell into a trance as I was praying. And I had a vision of something like a big sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners. The sheet reached the ground quite close to me. I watched it intently and saw all sorts of animals and wild beasts. 
everything possible that could walk, crawl or fly. Then I heard a voice that said to me, now Peter, kill and eat. But I answered, certainly not, Lord. Nothing profane or unclean has ever crossed my lips. And a second time the voice spoke from heaven. What God has made clean, you have no right to call profane. This was repeated three times before the whole of it was drawn up again into heaven. Just at that moment, three men stopped outside the house where we were staying. They had, come, they had been sent from Caesarea to fetch me. The spirit told me to have no hesitation about going back with them. The six brothers here came with me as well and we entered the man's house. He told us that he had seen an angel standing in his house who said, send to Jaffa and fetch Simon known as Peter. He has a message for you and will save you and your entire household. I scarcely began to speak when the Holy Spirit came down on them in the same way as it came on us at the beginning. And I remember that the Lord had said, John the Baptist, <coughs> with uh, John baptised with water, but you will be baptised with the Holy Spirit. I realised then that God was giving them the identical thing he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And who was I to stand in God's way? This account satisfies them and they gave glory to God. God, they said, had evidently granted even the pagans the repentance that leads to life. And it's that phrase in there. Who was I? Who was I to stand in God's way? And it's interesting, as I said, today, the 4th of May, <coughs> we remember the Reformation uh, era saints and martyrs. And that whole argument that was going on for several centuries about who had the truth, who was right and um, who who was more holy, more pious, more religious, who was a better adherer to God. And of course, that was exactly the argument that Peter was dealing with in the early church, because the struggle was that um, people felt that it was only those who had been Jews before that could, in a sense, become Christians um, and that those uh, um, uh, early Christians who were Jews still had to adhere to all of the Jewish uh, rules and regulations um, that had been laid down for centuries. And in particular, that meant that <clears throat> various things, including people, were regarded as unclean. So as we know, uh, <coughs> in the Jewish tradition, uh, for example, you don't eat pork um, or shellfish. There's sort of various other foods that, that aren't eaten. And also in the Jewish tradition, um, pagans, or in a sense people who were not Jewish, were regarded as unclean. And if you associated with them, that would somehow tar your holiness and make you unclean. So this was a big tension in the early church. That's why I said nothing changes. And of course, that was a big tension in the Reformation um, era. But here, um, Peter clearly has this vision where God says, you know, he lowers down all of these animals and things that for, for a, uh, uh, an adherent to Judaism like Peter um, would have been an absolute no, no. It would have made him richly unclean um, if he had touched or killed or eaten any of those animals. But three times the sheet is lowered down and God says, you know, don't you decide what is uh, clean and unclean when I have decided what is clean? And after that, he then goes to the house of the pagans in Caesarea Philippi. And you just you just imagine that you, you know, OK, Peter was a Galilean fisherman, but he was a, a, a Jew all of his life. It's a bit like um, Top Off, if you've ever watched Fiddler on the Roof, you know, that's the kind of character he probably was. He was a bit larger than life um, and tradition, tradition, tradition. That was his thing. You know, and even more so now he had encountered Christ and all of that wrestling in him. But no, eventually he puts all of that aside and he goes to Caesarea, uh, Caesarea and he enters the house of a pagan, which would have made him unclean. He eats with them. He would have eaten their food and everything like that. And he witnesses them receiving the Holy Spirit. 
Amen. It's just fantastic that God is showing his love to everybody. And then you get the arguments in the Reformation era. And what where are we today in the church? I mean, we're all locked up and away from our church. But one of the things that has constantly frustrated me, both as a Christian pilgrim on the journey and as a Christian minister, is the sorts of lists that churches, organised religion and churches draw up of people who are clean or unclean, who are righteous or not righteous, who have the truth and who don't have the truth. And, and the list can be quite extensive. At the moment, of course, the big argument in the church is all around issues of human sexuality, um, that people that don't fit into whatever is perceived as normal are somehow outside of the sphere of God's love and um, are somehow sort of regarded as unclean. Um, <clears throat> I had a couple in my congrega uh, previous congregation in uh, Shrivenham, and I'm sure they won't mind me sharing this, uh, Charlotte and Kate, and um, they were a couple. And Charlotte had, was a, uh, Kate wasn't, I, know, I knew Kate since she was at primary school, her dad had been the caretaker. And um, she wasn't particularly religious, but her partner Charlotte was, she'd been a Christian all her life. And then when she had come to terms with um, her own sexuality, which wasn't what <clears throat> might be called mainstream, she realised that she was gay. She suddenly found this huge conflict in her life um, between what her church was telling her and what she felt inside. She still felt close to God. She still felt loved by God. And I'm sad to say that her church just about coped with her coming out and being gay. But then when they when it said that she had a partner, they more or less kicked her out of the church. And I, I'm sorry, folks, whatever people, wherever people are on this, as an outsider myself who came into the church because I wasn't brought up as a Christian, and as a person who has lots of friends who are gay, I just don't get that. I don't get it. I don't get it because they are children of God too. And um, they're fallen in all sorts of ways in exactly the same way uh, as I am. And that verse in, um, in that uh, uh, Acts of the Apostles, which says, you know, who are you to say who is clean and unclean? God saying that to Peter. And I'm very, very wary of that. So I don't like to <clears throat> make assumptions and judge. Um, I know it's a very complicated theological argument. Believe me, um, I had to write a six and a half thousand word dissertation or short paper on it when I was at Theological College. So I'm well versed in all of the biblical arguments about it. <clears throat> but I, I tend to take people as they are. And um, what's important to me is what's in a person's heart, how they live their lives, how they respond to others, how they try and love and care for others. I'm not particularly hung up on who they may or may not um, fancy. I, d I don't think it's a massive issue. And I know lots of people struggle um, with, uh, do struggle with that. But for me, it's that passage that I don't want to be in a position where I, uh, even though I've studied the scriptures in depth, I've looked at this subject really, really closely and I know all of the arguments into it. I do not want to put myself in a position where I am potentially like Peter in that situation, deciding who is clean and who is unclean, who is right or who isn't right. And it's not just the human sexuality issue. It can be all sorts of lists. The lists go on and on and on. I mean, uh, what was it? Uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, we had the whole thing about the ordination of women. And for some reason, women couldn't be ordained or couldn't be priests because for some reason um, they were quite as good as us guys. You know, we had that argument in the church for 20 years, folks. It really, it, it's mind blown. I, I <laughs> don't get it because um, I've always come as a Christian pilgrim that we're all God's people. And um you know, sometimes people uh, mess up, sometimes they get things wrong, sometimes they're not good, sometimes they can be particularly nasty. Um, but I don't believe in just labelling one huge group of people with one brush. Um, pilgrimage is about walking along the road with people. And when you walk along the road with people, they may be different from you in all sorts of ways, but you soon suss out whether 
in a sense um they're they're walking on the road you know and um uh, uh i'm sh i'm sure all of us can think you know i've got lots of friends who with things i don't agree on you know that's what true friendship is about you know i don't necessarily agree with everything that they are but there's something at the core that makes us happy to share that pilgrim road together and i do have a very close friend who's a lovely minister paul eddie <coughs> he might listen to this uh, uh paul has a completely different view on the issue of human sexuality uh to me and uh, we chew the cud over it time and time again um but i love paul to bits um we both have a, a a passion for the mission of the church and i know it's a big issue for him he really struggles with it um you know but um that doesn't mean i'm not prepared to work, work walk the pilgrim road with it because the flip side can be that we then decide all of those people in the church who struggle with this issue who can't uh who, who find it difficult to get to grips with we suddenly tar them with a, a particular brush and i see that happening as well uh, and i don't want to go there uh Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength and love your neighbours as yourself. That's what I've tried to base my uh, life on. And um, I try not to get into deciding um, who is right, who is wrong, who is in, um, who is out. That's God's job, not mine. My job as a minister is purely to introduce everybody uh, to Jesus, um, a bit like <coughs> Andrew and um, uh, and Philip. Anyhow, sorry, I've rabbited on. You've ended up with a Monday sermon. I do apologise <coughs> about that. But um, it's such an important text. Do go back and read it. It's the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11, verses 1 to 18. <coughs> and maybe if you want something to reflect over this week. And we all do it. I even do it, even though I'm aware of that passage. Just think about the people that we, for whatever reason it might be, they might be a different colour, they might be a different faith, they might have a different creed, whatever it is. And we sort of put them on a list and we put them out there. And maybe it's worth reflecting on how God sees those people because he sees them all as his children. Um, anyhow, back to St Francis. <coughs> um, following the um, principles of the uh, Franciscan order, and of course, that passage links in massively with Franciscanism because um, St. Francis was terrified of lepers and lepers were definitely on the list of the outcast. And he had a huge problem with them. But one of the wonderful stories is that Francis, then after his conversion, he went and kissed and embraced a leper and gave him his cloak. Um, so he got rid of the lists, <laughs> which was important. Anyhow, we didn't have um, day three yesterday because it was Sunday and I couldn't incorporate this. So I'm going to read to you um, the principles or the rule for the um, Third Order Franciscans. I'm going to give you day three and uh, day four together. And we're continuing on what we call the object. Jesus calls those who would serve him to follow his example and choose for themselves the same path of renunciation and sacrifice. To those who hear and obey, he promises union with God. The object of the Society of St Francis is to build a community of those who accept Christ as their Lord and Master and are dedicated to him in body and spirit. They surrender their lives to him and to the service of his people. The third order of the Society consists of those who, while following an ordinary prof uh, professions of life, feel called to dedicate their life under the definite discipline and vows. They may be female or male, married or single, ordained or lay, and day four, which is today. When St Francis encouraged the formation of the Third Order, he recognised that many are called to serve God in the spirit of poverty, chastity and obedience in everyday life, rather than in a literal acceptance of these principles, as in the vows of the brothers and sisters of the First and Second Orders. The rule of the third order is intended to enable the duties and conditions of daily living to be carried out in spirit. So in a sense, we do take on this idea of uh, uh, the threefold thing that you find in monastic life, poverty, chastity and obedience. Um, but we then sort of <coughs> live it out uh, in a different uh, in a different way, uh, because obviously I'm married, so um, uh, I don't have chastity in that sense. But the spiritual idea of chastity is in a sense of um, what do we deny ourselves um, f 
from the world and what I said about yesterday about um, sheep following whoever will feed them. Uh, what do we deny ourselves? Uh, what, what do we chase ourselves in the world? That's the, uh, the logic behind it. So let's have a Franciscan <coughs> um, uh, praise. Um, so this is from the uh, <coughs> Rule of the Friars Minor, uh, 2012. Uh, sorry, uh, 1221. Let every creature in heaven and on earth, in the sea and in the depths, give praise, glory, honour and blessing to him who suffered so much for us, who, give, who has given so many good things and who will continue to do so for for the future. For he is our power and strength. He who alone is good. He who is most high, who is all powerful, admirable, glorious, who alone is holy, praiseworthy and blessed through endless ages. Amen. So let's just pray this morning. Heavenly Father, <clears throat> as we enter this seventh week of lockdown, we pray for all of us as a nation. We pray for those who are struggling with lockdown, particularly those feeling the isolation or loneliness, those who are struggling with relationships at home. We pray for our government and all people in positions of authority and responsibility as they look to see how this lockdown will be gently eased over the coming weeks and months. We pray for all medical professionals and staff working in our hospitals and those scientists working in laboratories dealing with tests and looking at new ways of treating this virus or hoping to develop a vaccine. We pray for our schools as they look to uh, gearing up to going back to school in some form and our young people and children. We pray especially for head teachers and teachers as they make these preparations in the coming weeks. And we pray for our school here, particularly at Sixpenny Handley and for Rachel, our head teacher. We pray for those who have gone out to work today, those who have come to empty our refuse bins today, those who have gone to work in shops, those who have gone to other essential businesses. And we pray, Lord, for those who have lost their jobs and income over this period, those who are worried about the future of their businesses. We pray, Lord, that you will help us and guide us through this time of uncertainty and darkness. We pray also this morning for Mary McLeod. We give thanks that her operation on her hip went successfully and that she's now recovering well in Salisbury Hospital. We pray for a swift uh, recovery for her and that she may soon be back at home. And uh, we pray, Lord, for all of us this day and this week, that we may find joy in the simplicity of life and the blessings that you give to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you for being with me this morning. I'm sorry I've gone on a little bit longer uh, than usual, but that was a brilliant text from the Acts of the Apostles. Um, I hope you have a fantastic day. Um, I'm going to try and get some fresh air and stay awake uh, and avoid any more plumbing at five o'clock in the morning. And um, uh, I hope everything goes well with you today and look forward to seeing those of you who can join us uh, tomorrow. Let's just finish with the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. God bless everyone. Have a good day.